Yeah, so in, 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 in basically you would, in the extreme case, you would take all possible um, sets of private keys, so you'd get this huge collection of potential fundamental domains. You take the intersection of them, and then you'd look at the biggest box that fits in that intersection. Okay. In practice, you can sort of estimate how big it would be. But that's an excellent question, because also in practice, for GGH, well, okay, so this is what I said. You leak no information, because the outputs look the same. But that's a really good question, because it comes, it, it determines how hard it actually is to find a signature that Alice wants to release. Right, how many times does she do that two through four loop, choosing new random things? And that depends on how big the box is. And it turns out for GGH, if you want a box that's okay for sort of most choices of private keys, the box is really, really small. And your chance of generating, uh, even of Alice generating a valid signature is very, very small. And it becomes totally impractical, or at least highly inefficient. You really don't want to generate, you know, 100 million potential signatures to get a good one. I mean, a 1% success rate is probably okay, because it's, it's pretty fast. 50% would be even better. So, what Lubashevsky and others did, I mean, he didn't just propose this as you could do this with GGH, but it's completely pointless, so why bother, because it's impractical. They actually figured out how to use this in, well, not GGH, but a, another lattice-based scheme. Um, and interestingly, they didn't make the output end up as uniformly distributed in a box. What they did was they made the outputs normal distributed, Gaussian distributed, in a certain, um, certain range. Um, which, which helped with the practicality. It also made it much more complicated because internal to the signatures, you have to keep generating random numbers that are Gaussian distributed. Well, most random number generators give you a uniform distribution output, so you kind of have to use rejection sampling in the middle there to turn the uniform distribution into a Gaussian distribution, and then you use that to potentially reject your signatures. However, they're very clever people, and people since then have improved it even more. And Falcon, the signature scheme I mentioned for NIST, in fact does use this Gaussian kind of thing to improve um, the efficiency and um, anyway, it's pretty cool. But what I thought I'd do today is try to describe for you a rejection sampling scheme, which actually literally is just trying to produce a uniform distribution so that your signatures and my signatures and Alice's signatures and Bob's signatures, the list of signatures, all looks the same. It's uniformly distributed in some sort of region. Um, and I actually did write out a complete description of the signature scheme and then a complete description of rejection sampling and how it works and why it works. Um, and that would have taken too long. So what I'm going to skip is a description of the signature scheme itself. I'm just going to tell you what the signatures look like and how you would do the rejection sampling. And then we'll prove if you don't do rejection sampling, here's how you can break it. And if you do do rejection sampling, literally the signatures have no information content uh, about the private key. Okay. So the scheme again uses the, this, I usually call this a cyclotomic ring. It's a product of cyclotomic rings. Um, so integer coefficient polynomials of degree at most n minus one, and you multiply mod x to n minus one. So the same, same ring that we were using before. Um, as usual, we'll write a polynomial as some i equals zero to n minus one with coefficients. If it's in the ring R, of course, it has coefficients in Z. 
And I'll write absolute sub-infinity for the infinity norm, or also called the soup norm, or the max norm, just the maximum of the absolute value of the coefficients. Okay? And what I want to do is I want to define a box in here, right? I, I mean, if you ignore the multiplication structure, but just think of this as a Z module, this is just Z to the N. Z cross Z cross Z cross Z N times. And you're adding vectors by adding coordinates. Um, and I want a notation for a box in there where the first coordinates in a certain range, the second coordinate and the third coordinate. And that's this R square bracket B. It's the set of polynomials, or if you like, the set of vectors whose largest coordinate is no more than B. Okay? So for example, if N is two, so we're in two space, those are the pictures we saw before. This would literally just be a little square. Except, yeah, ex except these are in R, so the, the integer one. So, so it's, 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 a, it's a box in the lattice. Um, as an example, what's R square bracket one? That's all the polynomials of degree up to n minus one, or all, all these n tuples of integers, such that every integer is less than or equal to one. So it's zero, one, or minus one, okay? People sometimes call these trinary or ternary uh, vectors or polynomials, right? By analogy with binary, where it's all zeros and ones. So trinary or ternary, minus one, zero, and one. Okay, so here's our prototypical rejection sampling scheme. I'm going to set the parameter n, which as usual is just my x to the n minus 1 that we modded out by, um, and an integer k, which is going to, k is going to determine the box where we're willing to release signatures. And you'll see that in a minute. What's Alice's secret key? Well, for concreteness, let's say it's a polynomial with coefficients 1, 0, and minus 1. So a ternary polynomial. Alice also chooses just a random polynomial whose coefficients are between minus k and k. Okay. That's what the R square bracket k is, it's polynomials whose coefficients are between minus k and k. And when I say random, I mean uniformly randomly in this collection. And when signing, what she also does is she basically, she takes her document, her public key, and the random polynomial y. Well, not quite, something related to the random polynomial y. And she hashes them all together, and she gets this small polynomial C, again, with coefficients 0, 1, and minus 1. that comes out of a hash function. And that's what I don't want to go through exactly where it comes from. So you can kind of think of this kind of magically appears and it's associated to her public key and her document. Okay. Eventually, Alice is going to tell Bob what C is. So, so this will be a public quantity. Okay. Alice's signature um, basically just computes this computation, and this is not quite right. I didn't mean to do this with integer coefficients. There should have been a mod Q here, okay? Just like we did with ntrue, you m do this multiplication of these polynomials that have integer coefficients, and then, oh no, I take it back. This one doesn't have any reduction mod Q. Uh, so let's do a rewind two sentences. Um, Alice computes this polynomial, which is all just integer coefficients. So there's her private f that had small coefficients, the c that came out of the hash function that also has small coefficients, the y that she chose randomly that has sort of medium-sized coefficients, and easy enough, she computes that, and that's the signature S on her document. But she doesn't release it yet. There's the rejection sampling step. If any coefficient of S is bigger than K minus N, remember those are the two parameters, 
then Alice doesn't like that signature. She rejects it. She goes back to step three, chooses a new random Y. And she keeps doing this until eventually all of her coefficients are less than K minus N. And then she publishes her signature, which is this S that's past the rejection sampling step and the C that she found in, in step four. Okay, so I want to do two things for you. I want to show you first that if Alice skips the rejection step and just at step five she publishes S and she publishes a bunch of these signatures, then that's bad. You actually can recover her private key from that list of signatures. Then I'm going to show you that if she does include the rejection sampling step, the transcript contains no information about the private key. So here, right, usually you're trying to prove transcript security. You're secure against attacks on transcripts. I'm going to prove transcript insecurity. Um, suppose Alice publishes a whole list of signatures, but she ignored the rejection sampling step. A very unwise thing to do. So here's the calculation. It looks a little complicated. Let me step through it step by step. Each step's not that complicated, and the reason for it is not that complicated. So what Alice is going to do is she's going to take the signatures. She's basically she's going to prove she's going to compute an average of the products of the SI times C, S1 times C1, S2 times C2, S3 times C3, and so on. But there's a slight wrinkle. Remember, the, the S's are polynomials, right? In that polynomial, and the C's are also. She'll multiply SI of X times CI evaluated X to the N minus 1 instead of at X. Remember, X to the N is really 1. Right, we're modding out by x in minus one. So this in the ring, this is actually x inverse. It's the inverse of x in that ring, if you like. Anyway, it's easy enough to compute this in the ring. She does it how many times? Well, I use capital T's for, that's how many signatures are in the transcript, say. A hundred, a thousand, a million, a lot. Even if it's a hundred million, this is perfectly reasonable to compute. 